Please always consult with your physicians prior to making any changes to your treatment plan. Music is courtesy of Ryan Hamner. Welcome to Living with Scanxiety, the cancer podcast, a podcast geared to help you navigate the pediatric cancer world. As a mother of a child who battled a soft tissue sarcoma for over a year, your host, Rosaria Kozar, understands and will help guide you through your journey. She brings the knowledge of experts, families, survivors, and other organizations tied to the pediatric cancer world to your doorstep. Her mission is to inform, support, and promote hope for you and your family. This is where hope lives. This is where hope thrives. Together as one. What happens to these individuals after they survive? It's a huge, huge, huge moment um, for these individuals. But like I mentioned, um, what happened what happened during the treatment will affect what happens later on your life and for some for the rest of your life. Hello and welcome. I have Juanita Prada here with me today. She is not only amazing because she's such an advocate, but for the childhood cancer community, but she also is a cancer survivor. So she knows what she's talking about because she's been there. She's done it. She's been through it. And if you can take any advice or any word from anyone, it's definitely Juanita who pursues this advocacy not only through giving speeches and and making people aware firsthand on a bilingual basis so both spanish and english we're going to be doing english um but she also has a youtube style igtv on instagram and it's called be hold be gold so if you ever get a chance go check it out her videos are really fun um when she interviews people so yes, check it out. And here we go. Welcome, Monita, to the show. Hey, Rosaria. Thank you for having me. Woohoo! Scanxiety is awesome. <laughs> Scanxiety itself isn't awesome, but yes, I, I mean, I agree. My show, my show is awesome. I love your show, Scanxiety, because you are so educational and you spread the word and you preach it, and I just love it. And you're the one of the first people I. I connected with on social media when I started Behold Be Gold because I feel like we started our advocacy movements at around the same at around the same period. Yeah, I really do. I think we did. And I had an awful lot of fun on uh, being interviewed by you and sharing my story. And I just love your style. That's really good. But I think you have so much to offer the community and you don't necessarily have a platform to do it for yourself in terms of podcasts. So I, I would love for you to be able to be on a podcast, uh, which you are right now, the second. And <laughs> if you can't tell what Juanita and I are kind of friends here. So if we get goofy, that's why. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the beginnings of your story? Of course, yes. Um, so I was diagnosed with pre-B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, at the age of 10. Um, and it really, um, it all started, you know, I was, yeah, it was the first week of fifth grade. And it's one of those, obviously, those days that you will never forget, how, no matter how young you are. Um, well, possibly maybe the, you know, the age does have a factor, but, you know, I wasn't uh, 10 years old, so I could clearly remember um, I was feeling weakness, fatigue, um, low on energy. Um, I had, you know, unexplained fevers, bone pain. I was limping. Um, I was bru bruising everywhere really easily. I constantly would complain to my parents and I would say that, you know, I literally was not feeling well, but, you know, as we all know, or, you know, the cancer childhood cancer community knows that, um, a cancer diagnosis is very, um, it's not pinpointed down. So it, it was a, it was a hard time from the beginning trying to like know what exactly it was that I had. We, you know, we had to go to multiple doctors um, and, you know, they said like it was just, you know, I was having growing pains. Um, you know, I was just bruising because I fell on the playground, um, et cetera, you know. So so those were my symptoms when it started. Um, I was diagnosed August 28, 2003. 
um, at the age of 10, like I mentioned. Um, it was, you know, a, un, a state of uncertainty, shock, disbelief, and it was a lot, everything along those lines. As we know, childhood cancer is one of those things that you would never expect you would be the one to get it. Um, so during my induction phase, um, it was, you know, I had 15 chemotherapy drugs, um, and, uh, those who are familiar with the chemotherapy phases and induction and, um, consolidation and et cetera, it's, it's a lot of phases, right? <laughs> Absolutely. To, you know? Um, so the first phase, which is, you know, initially like, okay, we need to get this girl into treatment right now. Um, and what was happening around that moment, just to have a little bit of context, and because childhood cancer always hits us in the moments that obviously we never want childhood cancer to hit us, but it, it always, for some reason, the people I interact with and they tell me their childhood cancer stories, it always lands on birthdays or on Thanksgiving or on um, holidays, you know, and, and for me, it was like I said, it was my first day of fifth grade. Um, my dad at that moment was married to my stepmom who was um, with me at the time because my dad left to Columbia be, to be in uh, his brother's funeral. And so we're talking about uh, Columbia, not South Carolina, but Columbia, uh, South America, right? Just to put that into context there. Um, so my stepmom called my dad and this is this, you know, my cancer diagnosis was uh, a like three years before we moved to the States. So we're, we're in a moment where we're just like, okay, bam, you know, we're culture shocked. We're trying to uh, get into the rhythm and everything into being in the States. And then unfortunately um, this illness occurred. Um, so, you know, my dad did marry, um, was married to my stepmom who she is American. So she had more of a sense of like, you know, the English language, um, nobody, obviously, a lot of the medical language is complicated enough already. Uh, thankfully, my dad has um, family members who are doctors and were helping him along the way. But anyways, he was in Colombia. Um, and my stepmom calls him and tells him, um, you got to get here when he does not not doing well, we've taken her to a couple of doctors. And um, basically, she told him that it's pretty serious that he needs to get here real quick. So my dad left his uh, right away, his brother's funeral. He took a plane, the first plane back to the U.S. Um, to Virginia, which is where I am. And and then when he came back, you know, I remember just like being I went to school um, and then you know, they took me out of school and I went to, I, I went to the nurse's station and I told her like, I was crying. I had a really high fever. Like I mentioned, I was just like, I just need to go home. My stepmom came to get me. Um, again, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but we went to the doctors and then we took me to the children's hospital here. Um, and, and then there, you know, my dad was back already at, uh, in the States. And then um, they sent me, you know, they separated me, which I think nobody should ever do that, but they separated me, they separated me for the moment, you know, um, and they put my parents in one side to tell them the news. And then they put me like in another room to, to just kind of like me chill in there for a minute. Um, and so they told my parents that I had um, leukemia, you know, um, and as we, as we know, in the childhood cancer um, community and those who had had, um, you know, families or children, it's, it's devastating. Um, so um, I just remember being, and, you know, I wrote a poem about this because I'll never forget the moment and the specific day and everything. And you can also check that out on my, um, my media sites later. Um, but I wrote a poem and it just like, basically it's me describing like what my feelings of that day, you know, I was basically sitting alone, empty, empty room, fluorescent lights. Um, and nobody was there to kind of tell me what was happening. Um, and of course this all happened, you know, in the moment it all feels like frozen, but of course all this was happening fast, you know, but I was just like in a bit, in the, in the, on the bed. And then suddenly the doctor comes in, not my parents, the doctor, um, my stepmom and my dad were outside the room uh, crying their eyes out. Um, and then so uh, my doctor comes in, she rubs my back and she's like, Juanita, I know you're in a lot of pain, but we're going to get, we're going to help you get better. Um, we're going to help you get better. 
you know, and she was just rubbing my back. And I was like, who are you, stranger? Like, why are you, you know, like, I know you're trying to be comfortable, comfort me, but, but, you know, I was just, you know, at 10, you're just like in another world. Um, and you just want your parents to be there. But quickly, you know, after with that, my dad and my stepmom came in and they were just bawling their eyes out. And, and then, um, which I feel like obviously makes, I mean, it's a sad, it's a sad, devastating moment. So we were all crying. And as soon as they said cancer to me, I just, I just thought of a Sinjude commercial and a child without hair, because that's what I associated it to just like no hair. So for me at that age, um, for me, the hair was a huge thing. I didn't, you know, I didn't even think of the fact that, um, I mean, I did think, you know, the concepts of death and dying, I think, you know, as you, as the younger you are, the less, you know, but as you get older, I mean, 10 years old, I already had a concept of death, you know, and cancer and associated cancer to death. Um, so, but, but for me at that moment, it was my hair because, because how would I go to school without hair? Like, and then again, that's, we're talking about school. We're not even thinking of like, I'm not even thinking about my health, you know, I'm not, I'm just thinking about my hair and not going to school, you know? So, so that was just kind of like what was happening in that moment. Um, so my first phase um, was induction phase and what happened. So of course they were running me through everything that was going to happen and my parents, and it was a different language. And when I say a different language, I mean, it was a different language in English and in Spanish. So we're, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, like I'm an advocate for, you know, both populations because it's one of those things that, wow, it's just, it's more of a stress too, just being not English, not being your first language and trying to figure all this childhood cancer stuff out. Um, so they told us that we were going to get a port cath you know, and that was kind of like the first thing for for the treatment. Um, and, you know, I had people explain that to me. I had a child life specialist explain that to me. Um, then my parents explained it to me and a surgery is always scary, of course. And what happens in a surgery room is always scary. Um, I went in there and heck, you know, I, um, what, what I had was, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Um, what it was it called? It's called, so I had an infection for my port, basically. It was an infection and it was called, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but it's um, Klebsiella cellulitis. I know which one you're talking about, but I can't say it either. But yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty hard to say. (laughs) (laughs) It it is one of the, yeah, medical terms are always hard to say, but basically I had that infection, um, which required a port removal during my first therapy. So, you know, I went in for the port, they put it in, the infection was there. uh, They were like, no, 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 you know. Um, we're taking this out. Um, and with that uh, came, um, you know, the, with that came, um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my thought. With that came the, I had a, a coma. Sorry, I'm like, what? Yeah, coma. I had a coma. It led me into a state of coma uh, while they were doing that surgery. So immediately, you know, we went from having that surgery to having the infection to go into a state of coma. And in that moment, um, you know, they did tell my parents, um, you know, my dad called my my mom and was like, you got to get here. Juanita is in, you know, in the ICU. She, we don't know how many more days she has. And you got to get in here now, now. And so my mom automatically you know, my mom's a woman of faith. Um, and she just like in her, and she was like, well, you know, and I'm not saying nobody else in my family didn't, everybody was praying and everything, but my mom was kind of like the one who was always told me, like, she knew that I was, that I was going to be okay. Um, and you know, my parents, my dad always also just was, you know, there the whole time. There's a lot of, you know, in childhood cancer, um, we have just like in life, right? We have our, our beliefs and everything, but I feel like a lot of like the positivity in the room and a lot of like the, um, just a lot of like that moment, I just felt like I needed my mom, you know? Um, and I think me having my mom there was just miraculously and she came and, you know, I was, I was 
literally, like I said, in a coma, I was like a vegetable and I was in there for a couple of days. Um, and my mom came and she like prayed over me and she like grabbed my hand and, and I don't know, some like weird shit happened there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, excuse my language, but I just felt like calm, you know, I felt peace. And again, I was in coma, so I don't really, I can't tell you, but I felt like, I felt like I was just like, this is, this was a miracle for me, from my perspective, because my doctors would point out that it, it just, you know, this doesn't happen. Um, anyways, it's one of those cases that you say like, this doesn't happen, but anyways. Um, so I got out of that state of coma. Um, what are the consequences? So from that, um, I went into, um, I went into. Oh, hold on before you. So you went into an actual coma. You had breathing tubes and everything i was completely completely covered in tubes everywhere oh my gosh everywhere i had to have um now i forgot the name of it but to like to breathe the tube that goes inside of you both like the one that makes you that helps you eat like a feeding tube Uh. and a tube exactly to help you just like wires everywhere that's how i can describe it you know yeah they um, they've a respirator isn't it yes yeah yes yep oh yep i was gosh. literally there you know the and what you know what you i mean literally what you see in, in movies and you just hear what i associated with 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 is just like the beeping noises that keep you kind of like hanging in there you know and your mom wow so brave to her of her to come and to have kept that hope it's true a miracle happened you came out of a coma after a very serious infection what was going through your mind when you were worried about the hair but what was going through your mind when you saw your parents crying well when i uh, it was just everything was everything was unrealistic i mean you know like it's just one of those things that everything's like blur in a dream and you just, it feels so surreal, like bizarre. It's so bizarre. And I saw them, I saw them and I'm just, everything was happened so quickly that I don't, I don't know. It's like, you don't have time to process it. And seeing them cry, I felt like, I don't know. I was just, uh, it was just, it, I mean, what can I say? It was just sad. You know, it's a sad, it's a sad feeling. It's a sad feeling. And, and I, and if, you know, as, as being a child, you're, you feel like, okay, my parents are going to protect me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like it's always, you know, it's, it's a sad topic for all and it affects all of us. It affects the whole family. It affects the child. And it's hard to lose your guard to not be upset, you know, but I felt like those tears were like needed for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And, and even though they were upset, I knew that, okay, they're going to be with me, like, as long as they're with me. I feel like, okay, you know, I don't know any of these strangers here in the hospital, but as long as I have my stepmom, my dad, my mom who comes once in a while too, you know, I will, I I feel like, okay, well, um, yeah. So it was, uh, to answer your question, it was just like, for me, I don't know. It was a long time ago too. So I'm like, oh, what what, what exactly, you know, did I think at that moment? But, but sadness, sadness, I think that's how you can describe it. Yeah. Um. So when you were going through treatment, were there times where do you wish that anyone handled it differently in front of you? And I ask for the caregivers out there so that maybe they can take some advice on how maybe they want to act in front of their child. So for me, what, you know, what you helped, um, I guess during my support system, I had my dad, he's very humorous. Um, And he makes everything, you know, just like a joke. Um, So that really helped a lot during my treatment that he was just like, he's just a humorous guy. And so he made everything a joke in the sense that if I was like saying something like horrible, he'll, he'll make a joke out of it for me to like either to laugh or to make it seem like it's not that bad, you know, or, or anxiety, lessen my stress, lessen my madness. You know, he would always be like, um, you know, there was, you know, um, there would always just be a time where he would just make a joke out of something that really helped a lot. 
uh, for me, for me, each individual is different. Um, I think just like the support and understanding of everybody and, and the, how do you say it? The collaboration, you know, the collaboration of everybody just, you know, I think that helped me cope better and, and, um, and, and just like, you know, being empathetic with your children, being empathetic with yourself. No, empathy is huge. It's so much bigger and better than sympathy. Um, and the worst thing could be toxic positivity, like, oh, your hair is going to grow back. Don't worry. I'm sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. Did you have that happen? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And, and of course, for a child, that does not work. For a teenager, it works even less. Well, that's toxic positivity. When someone like, oh, it's not that bad. This this is going to happen, you know, or you got the yeah. easy cancer. That brings me to after effects because you, you do after effects and as an advocate. So do you have any lasting after effects? And what are some of the after effects of those that you've communicated with on your show, show Behold, Be Gold? Um, yeah, so my after effects. So exactly. I, um, you know, I, I started Behold, Be Gold due to these late effects because I felt there wasn't enough talk about what happens after childhood cancer. There's a lot of networking. There's a lot of support, uh, which is amazing. Like before, way, you know, a few years back, we had no, none of this. Um, I feel like now we're getting into a move and we still, obviously we still need lots and lots more childhood cancer, um, research and support. Um, but we also need to focus on like what happens to these individuals after they survive. It's a huge, huge, huge moment, um, for these individuals. (sighs) But like I mentioned, um, what happened, what happened during the treatment will affect what happens later on your life. And for some, for the rest of your life. Um, So I had the stroke. I had the coma. Um, During my time of treatment and everything, I did have a few seizures. And then I, you know, I relapsed, which I I didn't mention that part, but I relapsed. um, With the same cancer? With, yep. I had a CNS relapse of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And this time it was um, in my right eye and I was, you know, I had to get radiation, a lot of radiation for that. Um, And my treatment in total lasted five years. Oh, wow. Um, So I was the first two years I was strictly in the hospital. I didn't leave unless it was like for a couple, (gasps) like I would say like, a weekend. I was one year straight in the hospital the year after that because of the infection. Wow. Um, So I didn't leave the hospital at all. I didn't have that life where I would go back to my house. No, I had to stay in the hospital um, because it was that serious. Um, And I was just working on speaking again. You know, my mind was of a four-year-old when really I was a 10-year-old. Um, so Were you I had a 10 to, year old inside, but you couldn't communicate more than a four. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was one of those moments in my life that I just, I, and we always try to hit again for normalcy and wanting to be like your friends. And, and that just wasn't, that life was not happening for me at the moment. You know, my friends, my friend was my child life specialist. Mm-hmm. My, my friends were my nurses. Mm-hmm. Um, and the people who surrounded me, you know, like my, my family. And that's, that is, that is your support system. That is your family at the moment. And those are your friends at the moment. Um, so I didn't know I had to learn, you know, I had the occupational therapist helping me go up and down the stairs of the hospital. I had the, um, you know, the, the other specialists, you know, the physical therapist, just like the speech therapist. I didn't talk. My eye was all the way down my cheek. So it was a lot of like learning how to, you know, my face was like paralyzed, you know, so I had to, the stroke, like, you know, I was, I was talking really slow, like, like, you know, and I saw, you know, it was a, it was a miracle that I even spoke from the beginning. So I had to learn, you know, my dad and my mom were speaking to me in Spanish. So I had to relearn how to speak in Spanish. And then my my the medical people were speaking to me in English, so I had to relearn how to speak in English. Um, and I would go home the times that I did the few times I did get to go home, my parents would put like the glass in front of me, for example. And the glass for me was all the way like back there when really was in front of me. So I had like spatial 
spatial um, like deficiencies. Okay. Um, and a lot of, you know, the balancing, I couldn't walk in a straight line. Oh, wow. You know, I would go to my neurologist um, and he would like, I don't know what the thing is called, but when they like do that to your knee, that ding, and you have the reflexes. Oh, um, you know, yeah, so. I don't know what it is. The one with the triangle where they hit you, they bump yeah, like you to your knee. Yeah. 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 It just, I don't know what it's called, but it's, um, yeah, it, yeah. it checks for your reflexes. Yep. Yeah. It, I had no reflexes. <gasps> oh, wow. Um, so it took a while again to, for me to get that back. Uh-huh. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot more to the story, but to keep it short, it was a lot of, it was a lot of recuperation. And, you know, I was to, to sum it up, you know, I was there from 10 years old until 15 years old. So I had a lot of, I have a lot of what I call like learning cognitive late effects. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I had dental late effects and so, okay. So, so for the cognitive late effects, um, they're the seizures, which I, which I had, I, I had, like I mentioned, I had the seizures when I was hospitalized, but they went away with, they went away mm-hmm. for a good period of my life. Um, they came back last in 2019. Oh, I wow. say last year, but no, they came back in 2019. Um, and that's why we call them late effects, right? The long-term effects, because they, you know, it was something that clearly happened to me when I was a child during treatment Mm -hmm. and it went away because I took, uh, I took a lot of medication and then, you know, they tell, you know, then you're like, sorry, then you're like seizure free. So obviously they're like, you don't need medication anymore. And then they came back. Um, so that was one of those things that I, I, as an advocate for, for childhood cancer and light effects, I always tell individuals who I talk to always get, you know, go, go, you know, don't keep your guard down, always like go and check up and have your checkups. Um, and it's important. It's important to keep ourselves like up to date, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we want to be over with this whole cancer thing because eh, that happened to us with when we were children, right? Eh, we don't, we don't care anymore. Right. We want to do our lives. We want to do everything. We just want to be normal. We just don't want to have to deal with this. However, your life, you know, one day could just dramatically change because something happened. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So those were my cognitive layer effects were, were challenging during school. Um, I, I struggled. I still struggle. I struggled so much during education um, I would, I would stay after school every day, um, for like three more hours, you know, to, and this is when I was, you know, already back into normal routine at school, um, after cancer, after round number two, um, and I would have homeschooling, I would do summer school. Oh my gosh. I just, I, I hated school. I hated school because of these late effects, because I couldn't comprehend what was happening, you know? Um, it was just the, the subjects that were the, that are the hardest for me are math and, um, for example, biology, I had to take biology three times. Um, and for school, I didn't even take a lot of, they, they were like, well, she had cancer. She doesn't have to take these classes. So I was like, yay for that. Right. But at the same time, that screws you up. Like when you're growing up, um, because you didn't learn those subjects, right? So when I go back into school, when I go back, when I'm in, you know, community college, I'm like, well, I didn't see this. I didn't study this. So then like everybody else did, but I didn't. Um, So that was a lot of that. I admire you though, because some people would just give up and take it for what it is. And here you are, you're putting in extra time, extra effort, you're going to be a child life specialist. Uh, and I'm guessing that's because a child life specialist had a huge impact on you. Just a guess. If you liked part one to this episode, which brings us to the conclusion here and now, you're going to love part two. So make sure you tune in. Thank you for tuning in to Living with Scanxiety. Please subscribe to hear more informative discussions like today's. Music is courtesy of Ryan Hamner.